Chapter 10 speaks of other favors which God grants to the soul in a different way from those already mentioned and of the great profit that they bring. There are many ways in which the Lord communicates himself to the soul by means of these apparitions. Some of them come when the soul is afflicted, others when it is about to be visited by some heavy trial, others so that his majesty may take his delight in it and at the same time may comfort it. There is no need to particularize about each of these. My intention is only to explain in turn the different experiences which occur on this road as far as I understand them, so that you, sisters, may understand their nature and the effects which they cause. And I am doing this so that you may not suppose everything you imagine to be a vision, and so that, when you do see a vision, you will know that such a thing is possible, and will not be disturbed or distressed. For, when you are, it is a great gain for the devil. He is delighted to see a soul distressed and uneasy, because he knows that this will hinder it from employing itself in loving and praising God. His Majesty also communicates himself in other ways, which are much more sublime and are also less dangerous, because, I think, the devil cannot counterfeit them. But, being very secret things, they are difficult to describe, whereas imaginary visions can be explained more readily. When the Lord so wills, it may happen that the soul will be at prayer and in possession of all its senses, and that then there will suddenly come to it a suspension in which the Lord communicates most secret things to it, which it seems to see within God himself. These are not visions of the most sacred humanity, although I say that the soul sees him, it really sees nothing, for this is not an imaginary but a notably intellectual vision in which is revealed to the soul how all things are seen in God and how within himself he contains them all. Such a vision is highly profitable because, although it passes in a moment, it remains engraven upon the soul. It causes us the greatest confusion by showing us clearly how wrongly we are acting when we offend God, since it is within God himself, because we dwell within him, I mean, that we are committing these great sins. I want, if I can, to draw a comparison to explain this, for, although it is a fact and we hear it stated frequently, we either pay no heed to it or refuse to understand it. If we really understood it, I do not think we could possibly be so presumptuous. Let us imagine that God is like a very large and beautiful mansion or palace. This palace, then, as I say, is God himself. Now, can the sinner go away from it in order to commit his misdeeds? Certainly not. These abominations and dishonorable actions and evil deeds which we sinners commit are done within the palace itself, that is, within God. Oh, fearful thought! worthy of deep consideration and very profitable for us who are ignorant and unable to understand these truths, for if we could understand them, we could not possibly be guilty of such foolish presumption. Let us consider, sisters, the great mercy and long-suffering of God in not casting us straight into the depths, and let us render him the heartiest thanks and be ashamed of worrying over anything that is done or said against us. It is the most dreadful thing in the world that God, our Creator, should suffer so many misdeeds to be committed by his creatures within himself, while we ourselves are sometimes worried about a single word uttered in our absence, and perhaps not even with a wrong intention. O oh, human misery! How long will it be, daughters, before we imitate this great God in any way? Oh, let us not deceive ourselves into thinking that we are doing anything whatever by merely putting up with insults. Let us endure everything and be very glad to do so, and love those who do us wrong. For, greatly as we have offended this great God, he has not ceased loving us, and so he has very good reason for desiring us all to forgive those who have wronged us. 
I assure you, daughters, that although this vision passes quickly, it is a great favor for the Lord to bestow it upon those to whom he grants it if they will try to profit by having it habitually present in their minds. It may also happen that, very suddenly, and in a way which cannot be described, God will reveal a truth that is in himself and that makes any truth to be found in the creatures seem like thick darkness. He will also manifest very clearly that he alone is truth and cannot lie. This is a very good explanation of David's meaning in that psalm where he says that every man is a liar. One would never take those words in that sense of one's own accord, however many times one heard them, but they express a truth which is infallible. I remember that story about Pilate who asked our Lord so many questions and at the time of his passion said to him, what is truth? And then I reflect how little we understand of this sovereign truth here on earth. I should like to be able to say more about this matter, but it is impossible. Let us learn from this, sisters, that if we are in any way to grow like our God and spouse, we shall do well always to study earnestly to walk in this truth. I do not mean simply that we must not tell falsehoods, for as far as that is concerned, glory be to God, I know that in these convents of ours you take very great care never to lie about anything for any reason whatsoever. I mean that we must walk in truth, in the presence of God and man, in every way possible to us. In particular, we must not desire to be reputed better than we are, and in all we do we must attribute to God what is His, and to ourselves what is ours, and try to seek after truth in everything. If we do that, we shall make small account of this world, for it is all lying and falsehood, and for that reason cannot endure. I was wondering once why our Lord so dearly loved this virtue of humility, and all of a sudden, without, I believe, my having previously thought of it, the following reason came into my mind, that it is because God is sovereign truth and to be humble is to walk in truth. For it is absolutely true to say that we have no good thing in ourselves, but only misery and nothingness, and anyone who fails to understand this is walking in falsehood. He who best understands it is most pleasing to sovereign truth because he is walking in truth. May it please God, sisters, to grant us grace never to fail to have this knowledge of ourselves Amen. Our Lord grants the soul favors like these because he is pleased to treat her like a true bride who is determined to do his will in all things and to give her some knowledge of the way in which she can do his will and of his greatness. I need say no more. I have said these two things because they seem to me so helpful, for there is no reason to be afraid of these favors, but only to praise the Lord because he gives them. In my opinion, there is little scope here either for the devil or for the soul's own imagination, and when it knows this, the soul experiences a great and lasting happiness.